From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and coming up today from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Jim Robb is featured on this week's cattle market segment. Jim will talk about the LMIC's forecast on red meat and poultry production, both in 2018 and 19, which he says will keep up the pressure to maintain domestic and export demand for beef. Then we'll meet the new sheep and meat goat specialist here at K-State, Allison Crane. She'll talk about her plans for research and outreach education on sheep and meat goat production as she assumes this new role. And for this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Beth Hinshaw will look at a trio of area leadership learning events for 4-Hers coming up soon. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. For our cattle market segment, we bring in once more from the Livestock Marketing Information Center in Denver, its director, Jim Robb, for some observations on the cattle trading trends as we swiftly wind down 2017, Jim. First of all, last week, it was a refreshing change for the better on just about all fronts when you look at the cattle trades. The uh, live cattle, the fed cattle market, Struggled early in the week last week trying to find you know a floor. The Packers bid quite a bit lower for the week, but by the end of the week we actually had a pretty stout trade on Friday afternoon, and we had uh, many trades above the prior week. So it seems like we kind of found a range to trade in here on the fed cattle. Feeder cattle markets were kind of mixed across the U.S., but uh, in many areas a little bit stronger than the prior week. And this is the time of year where these calf and yearling prices are often under pressure. Kind of the only thing swimming upstream was the wholesale beef market, Eric. It was down slightly for the week. Box beef cutout slipping for the week about 2%, but still 6% above a year ago on the wholesale meat market. Most of these cattle markets, uh, fed cattle markets, 6% above a year ago. And calf prices in many markets still pushing 20% above a year ago. So we're holding these markets together uh, rather well. So one shouldn't read much into that comparatively minor slippage in boxed beef last week. Maybe that's just a regular order of things. This is uh, very typical for this time of year to have some weakness as we really transition and we've had a lot of the holiday buying is behind us for the the tenderloins and the prime ribs. And uh, we're transitioning to the chucks and rounds. And, and so this is a rather weaker time of year in that wholesale beef market complex. Still packer margins are quite positive. And we look at the drop values are actually gaining a little bit of ground compared to prior weeks. So the meat side of the market is uh, is holding together, but uh, probably seasonal softness is how I describe it. And so, once more, you never can tell for sure, but the sense of it is that there is a floor now established in the fed cattle trade anyway. It appears so, Eric. You never know, but it seems like it's more of a sideways market than a market that has a clear downward momentum here in the near term nor rather a clearly upward direction until we probably get to after, you know, and see how the Christmas movement is and we get closer to the new year buying. So I think, uh, you know, a, a stable to sideways market largely is a, is one that uh, at this time, again, with it being fully 6% above a year ago on live steers and heifers for slaughter, uh, that's a market that we're kind of pleasantly surprised with. Jim, as we like to do every time we visit with you, we tap into information that you at the LMIC have posted on your website. It's always good fodder for discussion. One of the articles you have out there looks into 2018 and 2019, and what you consider, as the title of the article would infer, the major livestock and poultry market concern has to do with available supply in the next two years, you say. Well, when we put all of the supply of total red meat and poultry together, Eric, you know, it, it is a bit of a daunting, uh, just a, a sheer quantity or tonnage that'll be in the marketplace. 
Now, to set record large total red meat and poultry production in the United States is not unusual. We do that in many years, but we put it in the context of how much, if our export forecasts are right and some of these details of the story, you know, how much does this really mean per person? 2017, we ramped up uh, the per capita consumption by about 1.6 pounds per person for retail beef. Not a huge increase, but we're certainly climbing that number that has to move through the domestic marketplace. And when we look at 2018 in this total red meat and poultry supply construct, we're going to be the largest since 2007 if our export forecasts are correct. So, you know, asking the market to consume per person the most since 2007 is a headwind. That's a, a level we haven't seen in obviously 10 to 11 years as we look ahead. As we get into 2019, uh, we will gravitate even higher. The wheels are in motion to continue output across the sectors. The poultry output still growing, as is pork, as is beef, as is chicken. So it fits together in a puzzle that uh, is probably the major headwind. It does bring out, to how important the exports are. If we're going to produce this amount of total bread, meat, and poultry, those exports get more and more important in determining how much is in the domestic marketplace. So we consider this the biggest overall headwind uh, for the next two years, just the sheer tonnage that the market will need to absorb. The forecasts on pounds per capita for 18, 2018 at 218.5 pounds, almost 221 pounds for 2019. So much is hinging on export business. We have for quite some time lauded the movement of beef anyway in the export channels. What's your sense of it into the new year as far as red meats, generally speaking? And we could talk poultry as well, Jim. Will we be able to continue to move product abroad? Well, we've had a very good year, as you mentioned. Uh, this will be a record large year in terms of U.S. beef export tonnage. This past summer was a real struggle on U.S. exports, both in the pork complex and in the poultry complex overall. And uh, we saw a rebound in the October data, and it seems the preliminary data, so it seems like uh, the late 2017, we've started to regain a little bit of our export markets. Asia has been particularly challenging for our pork exports. We've been losing market share to Asia and South America, especially, um, especially in China. But uh, when we look overall, there's a little more hope than there was last summer that these other red meats, specifically pork and the poultry side, start to carry a little bit more of their own charge into the foreign markets than we've had in recent months. So that's a bit of a hopeful note, but as you well know, Eric, these export markets are a little bit fickle at times, and we'll be watching those closely. There is a USDA cattle on feed report due out this coming Friday. Will it be much of a market mover, or will it be rather tranquil, the, uh, the resulting impact of these expected numbers? Well, we never know exactly, Eric, how much is of the economists call is already in the market versus what happens after the numbers come out. But the numbers are a bit daunting, as they have been in recent months. Uh, we focus, as we often do in these reports, on placements. But I'm going to go through the, the broader story, too. So on the marketing side, the month of November was quite good. In fact, since USDA started the current cattle on feed report back in the early 1990s, the month of November should be our largest uh, cattle marketing month in the history of that report. So that's, you know, we're still moving the cattle in a, in a very timely way through the feedlots. The question mark will be on the placement side, the number of animals entering feed yards. And that number, as probably in recent months, may have a fairly wide range in terms of pre-report es estimates. Some of the fundamental reasons for that are how many heifers are still going into feedlots. We think that number is still large, but how large is it? And then we had a very large big surge in the number of cattle that came across from Mexico uh, last month. And it was about 50,000 head above a year ago. How many of those animals went to feed yards? How many of those animals went to grass programs in the Southern Plains? So we expect uh, that this placement number could be a bit of a market mover, as it has a little bit in recent months. We would have the marketings up 3.5% year over year, again, a good number. But placements up 6 to 7% year over year, with a clear possibility that this number could be more than 10% above a year ago. The number of heifers and the Mexican cattle coming north and, and the placements, given the feedlot situation, that could be a very large number. 
And if that is the case, these would be the largest placements for the month of November since 2007. And so, you know, you can see that we're moving to larger and larger numbers. Uh, we put it in the, the biggest context is the, just the head-on feed, and that number should be up fully 7% from a year ago. That's a very large year-over-year increase. So it will become important what the placement weights are. Are these lightweight animals, heavyweight animals? It could be a bit of a, a setback uh, in terms of, you know, just the, the head-on feed. And these would be the largest number of cattle on feed in U.S. feedlots since 2011, Eric. So um, I think it's a report that we'll be watching very closely and uh, has the potential to probably be a bit more of a market mover than even the recent reports have been. Hmm. And uh, potential for a touch of bearishness resulting from those numbers, although if the market is in fact anticipating this hike in supply at our feedlots, uh, maybe that negative impact will be tempered some, Jim. Could be tempered some, and and again, in a little bit longer term, if many of these animals are still heifers entering feed yards, Mm -hmm. does have some impact down the road in terms of the overall herd inventory numbers. So we don't always want to get lost in the very short-term numbers. We have to look at what maybe the -the down-the-road impacts are for the beef industry. Well, we can hope that there's not a Christmas surprise in those numbers. Again, USDA posting its monthly cattle on feed report this coming Friday. Jim, we appreciate the input on all of this, and happy holidays to you and yours. We'll talk again in 2018. Many thanks. It's my pleasure, Eric. That's from Jim Robb of the Livestock Marketing Information Center. He's the director there, and the center is a project which is, to remind, co-sponsored by K-State and numerous other land-grant universities. We'd invite you to check out the information that they post regularly on their website. It is good reading, to be sure, producers at lmic.info. Once more, lmic.info. And Agriculture Today returns after this over the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. We're back now on this Agriculture Today, and it is our first chance here on the broadcast to visit with the newly appointed Sheep and Meat Goat Specialist in the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State. And hers will be a quite busy agenda as she hits the ground running. Allison Crane is with us, and Allison, welcome to K-State, first of all. Thank you. You've been involved in outreach and research in sheep and meat goats for a time, correct? Uh, Mostly sheep. Meat goats are kind of a new thing for me. So um, that's kind of the most interesting part of this appointment is I'm going to be learning a lot um, throughout this process about meat goats. Uh, My background is mostly in sheep. As my education um, throughout college and graduate school is what got my exposure in the sheep industry. Um, I actually grew up with horses and cattle for the most part. So um, and then chose to be a part of the sheep industry as um, Throughout my experiences, I became more and more interested in that industry rather than horses and cattle. So what led you in that direction then? While I was in high school, I was working for a large animal veterinarian in Alabama and did a lot of beef cattle work and loved it and decided I wanted to go to college and be a veterinarian and um, work predominantly in large animals. And so I went to Berry College because they have a great record in um, acceptances to vet school. So while I was there, I was a supervisor at the beef unit, once again, following through with my interest, and they needed someone to take over the sheep unit, and I reluctantly said yes, And but from there, I started participating in undergraduate research and continued to manage the sheep unit and fell in love with sheep and the sheep people that are a part of that industry. They're just incredible, and decided I wanted to go to graduate school because I loved the research so much. And so college really shifted my interest 
a lot from how I started out. And then when I started looking at graduate school, I looked at North Dakota State University, and in particular the Hedinger Research Extension Center, um, which is in southwest North Dakota. And they are the primary sheep research flock for the university. And they were doing a lot of nutritional physiology and interactions with reproduction uh, type research. And I decided that was the direction I wanted to take my career and luckily got accepted into their program. And so I stayed there for my master's and my PhD because it was such a good fit for me um, and what I wanted to do with my future, which was exactly what I'm doing here. And your studies in your PhD work on reproductive physiology, correct? Correct. Although I did a lot of feedlot nutrition work in lambs as well. What attracted you to the position here at Kansas State University then? Coming here, um, one of the biggest things for me is I'm a new, brand new out of my PhD. So Kansas State has not only nationally, but is internationally known for their extension program. And not even just in sheep and meat goats, but through the swine, especially swine group and their beef cattle group. And being able to know that you're entering a university that has that type of background and that type of exposure on an international basis and being able to learn from people like that um, was a huge attraction for me because extension in a lot of states is struggling and it's not here. (laughs) So that's um, for me, that was a huge attraction. And then also the producers here throughout the interview process and then experiences with some of the producers before that, they're hungry. And that's how she producers across the country are. They're hungry for information and research and they just kind of want to be helped. And so getting to help another group of producers like that, that hasn't had anyone for a couple of years, just seemed like a good fit for me because that's going to push me forward in my career. And we might note, and it's not brag, it's fact, that K-State does have a state-of-the-art sheep and meat goat center, which was constructed just a few years ago, and that certainly had some allure to it, one would think. Definitely. It's shiny and purple. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So that definitely is a big part for me, too. I loved the research aspect of my graduate program, and having a facility that's shiny and ready to go and a set up for any type of research that I would want to do going forward is a huge attraction as well. And getting to hopefully write some grants and get hopefully some feeders in there, um, some automated feeders is a goal of mine, uh, just to continue with current industry standards and research standards and looking forward to doing some breed comparison type research because there's a great setup at that unit for doing feeding trials and breed comparison type research. A large part of your appointment is extension, which Mm -hmm. usually by definition means you'll be involved to some extent in youth sheep and meat goat exhibition activities. Correct, Um, which is also kind of a new thing for me. I um, did not grow up showing or judging any type of animals. I was mainly a barrel racer and a team roper, so (laughs) the whole judging aspect is quite new to me. Um, While I was at NDSU, I coached a wool judging team, and so that for me is um, how I mostly plan to contribute to uh, the youth side of things, having a collegiate wool judging team and hopefully igniting some level of interest at the 4-H level would be a large interest of mine. I've already had some contact with some county agents about doing that. So any further interest in that area, I would love to continue because as that is another passion of mine, the wool industry and mohair industry and getting to just teach people about a sector of the industry that has kind of disappeared over the years. And speaking of the industry, as you come in, how you read the sheep and meat goat sector in Kansas and uh, what ultimately you hope to contribute to it? Talking about the meat goat side of things, so across Kansas and across the country, the meat goat industry has exploded um, and continues to grow exponentially with no signs of slowing down. Um, which is incredible. There's such a market for goats, and um, you can grow goats anywhere and everywhere, and that's um, it's really exciting to see, and it's really easy to get youth involved in the startup there. It's been really interesting to see that grow. And so, yeah, getting to 
kind of ride that whole growth curve out um, is going to be really fun, and I hope to contribute a lot to that. We're actually working on this spring doing a goat feeding trial um, here at the unit. So that's it'll be my first experience feeding goats. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm really excited to kind of kick those results out for producers and people that are feeding goats across the state of Kansas. And there's been a lot of interest in that already. And on the sheep side, this industry in Kansas, something of an even keel over many years time. How do you perceive serving that side of it? So on the sheep side, yeah, things aren't quite as optimistic as the goat industry probably. However, on a national basis and in Kansas itself, there has been slight increases in growth in the sheep industry. And I think incorporating something like what we have at the unit, the Easy Care Flock, that seems to have a growing interest in the state of Kansas. And then there's also a lot of wool flocks still in existence in the state. And with the way land prices are and a lot of commodity prices, there's a lot of interest from young people in getting into the sheep industry as well, especially co-grazing uh, with cattle. And then them being able to go back to the farm or the ranch and be a part of that, it's a lot easier for them to buy in on the sheep side. So I've seen already, I've only been here two months, but already I've seen a lot of interest from young people wanting to be a part of the sheep industry in that aspect. Um, So getting to, once again, ignite that interest and show them that it is possible and that the cost of production is there and they can make money and still be in agriculture is really exciting for me. Well, to put it this way, you've a, a huge canvas to paint on here. Yes, so it huge. sounds like you get to structure yes. your programs as uh, you want yep. and as is needed out there. So that's got to be Definitely. exciting for you. Very, very exciting. Well, we're glad to have you on board, Allison, and uh, wish you well. And we'll be talking with you undoubtedly about specific events and topics pertaining to sheep and meat goat production in the coming months and years. Thank you for coming over. Thank you for having me. Newly appointed just a few weeks ago as the sheep and meat goat specialist, K-State Research and Extension. That's Allison Crane, and we'll likely be hearing more from her here on Agriculture Today. And we haven't had a chance to mention this yet, so while we've a moment ahead of the break, we'll note that K-State's Animal Sciences and Industry student competition teams have truly excelled during the 2017 seasons. The department can boast of the 2017 National Champion Meat Animal Evaluation Team and the 2017 World Champion Horse Judging Team. Also, the Reserve National Champion Meat Judging Team for this year, the Reserve National Champion Livestock Judging Team, and the Reserve National Champion Animal Science Academic Quadrathlon Team. Congratulations to all, and there's a good write-up on the entire accomplishments of all the animal sciences and industry teams this past season on the department's website. Have a look at asi.ksu.edu. We'll be back with today's agricultural news headlines for you. Also, this week's edition of Tree Tales, K-State Forester Jaron Tyndall awaiting with that, along with more still to come here on the K-State Radio Network. Please keep it right here. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's a glance now to today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. 
A coalition of more than 70 agricultural groups sent a letter last week to congressional leaders asking for an increase in the agriculture budget for the fiscal year 2018 Agricultural Appropriations Bill, which Congress is working on. That letter was sent to House and Senate Republican and Democrat appropriations leaders and to the leaders of the House and the Senate. Congress is still trying to iron out a full year funding package and is expected to largely maintain operating funding under 2017 levels until at least mid-January. This letter from food, agriculture, scientific, academic, veterinary, and consumer groups asked for Congress to substantially increase the discretionary budget cap for domestic programs and provide agricultural appropriations with a 5% increase. If spending is raised, these groups state, agricultural investment should be a top priority. The groups argued that appropriations subcommittees for agriculture agriculture are currently hamstrung by a budget cap that does not reflect the importance of the agriculture and food sectors to everyday Americans. The letter reads, and quoting here, the USDA and the FDA bill is the smallest of all the appropriations bills, save for the legislative appropriation. The success of the American farm and food system has made it possible for the consistent transfer of resources into other sectors. So goes the letter. Now, the farm bill already will be shaped by the outcome of the fiscal year 18 budget because the Senate funding bill includes improvements for the safety net for dairy producers and would allow cotton producers to Role in the price loss coverage program for cottonseed. If those programs stay in the final bill, that will establish a funding baseline in the farm bill to support both the dairy and the cotton program adjustments. Since fiscal year 2010, the inflation adjusted agricultural appropriations budget has fallen by 20 percent, while most other areas of the federal government have grown or not seen the same kind of cuts. Those reductions pose immediate and long term threats to production, natural resources, resources and the ability to lead on an increasingly competitive global stage, which is why the trend of declining investment must be reversed now, as the letter read. Now, the letter was released by the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And interestingly, it was signed by a broad range of groups, but there were some oddities about who signed it and who didn't. The National Farmers Union signed the bill, but the American Farm Bureau Federation did not. Crop groups supported the request, but the livestock and meat groups generally did not sign the letter. And a group of 20 bipartisan senators sent a letter to the Senate leadership calling for a delay in the implementation of electronic logging devices for commercial motor vehicles transporting livestock. That letter, organized by Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas, along with Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota, asking the Senate leadership to support including in the final fiscal year 18 transportation, housing, and urban development appropriations bill that the House provision would delay implementation of E. ELDs and provide the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Association more time to review the needs of agriculture. That would give the association time to make the necessary adjustments, they say, to the hours of service rules to address animal welfare concerns. A similar letter in the House of Representatives was signed by 67 congressmen. The DOT rules limit truckers to 11 hours of driving daily after 10 consecutive hours off duty and restrict their on-duty time to 14 consecutive hours which includes non-driving time. In November, the association allowed a 90-day waiver to exempt truck drivers hauling agricultural commodities from the December 18th ELD implementation deadline. And despite the August first tariff hike from 38.5% to 50% on frozen beef out of the U.S., Japan's imports have continued to rise year over year. The Japan Ministry of Finance figures reported, currently available through October, show a 16% year-over-year rise for total imports of frozen beef in the August to October period. The year-over-year increase is showing every month since the tariff hike. The jump was 18% in September and 18% in October. For U.S. frozen beef only, that jump 15 Fifteen percent in September and just over 13 percent in October. Time now for this week's edition of Tree Tales. And with that, K-State Forester, Jaron Tyndall. Jaron? The most productive and diverse part of our landscape is usually right next to our streams. This is known as the riparian area, and its management has received increased attention in recent years due to the critical part it plays in water and wildlife issues. 
Rehabilitating a degraded riparian system is a complex undertaking. Landowners wishing to improve the natural function of a streamside area should first try to identify and understand the problems that have led to its decline. This will inevitably inform what practical opportunities there are for restoration. Things like land use, topography, historic fire frequency, climate, precipitation, and historic plant and animal communities must be considered. It takes a great deal of planning and patience to implement a riparian restoration or enhancement project. Vegetation plays a critical role in stream bank and riparian area protection. Successfully re-establishing an appropriate plant community is one benchmark of successful restoration projects. Riparian plants provide a number of functions including bank stabilization, moderating moisture regimes, and protecting banks from stream flow. A dense mixture of vegetation over the entire bank is desired to reduce sensitivity to future disturbances. Its importance is magnified in areas that have easily mobilized soil materials such as sand or glacial loss. Landowners often need to correct or entirely reset the cycles of plant dominance that have been initiated by human controls. Factors that led to the creation and character of the historic riparian ecosystem should be understood and mimicked. Both total plant density and the relative density of each plant species can be brought back into balance over time. Where remnants of the historic plant community are still present, careful management can guide plant succession into the future. When the appropriate plant species are not present in sufficient numbers to regain dominance on the site, they can be reintroduced as part of a riparian buffer planting. Riparian buffer plantings can serve several important functions. Like a natural system, well-designed buffers can preserve the characteristics of the water body, protect water quality, and improve habitat for wildlife in the surrounding area. To optimize their effectiveness in controlling agricultural contaminants, riparian buffers should be planned with an awareness of adjacent land uses and management. A well-designed buffer system may include not only a buffer area established on land next to a stream, but also plantings that stabilize the stream bank. You've been listening to Part 5 in the Tree Tail series, Riparian Systems. For more information on riparian areas and their management, please visit kansasforest.org. This has been Jaron Tyndall with the Kansas Forest Service, bringing you another tree tale. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. For you now on Agriculture Today, our weekly time set aside to catch up on the Kansas 4-H program and its activities. And we'll concentrate this time around on a series of what are being called Area Leadership Learning Opportunities for 4-Hers. They are set to go in January. And with the details, Beth Hinshaw joins us once again via phone from her office in Hutchinson, Research and Extension 4-H Specialist for Southeast Kansas. So in effect, this is an effort to take leadership training to the country as opposed to a centralized location, which 4-H has often operated in the past. Right, Beth? That's correct, Eric. You know, as people know, in 4-H, what we do is we empower young people with the skills to lead for a lifetime. And so we want to give leadership opportunities to young people all over the state. And so sometimes that happens at state events and activities. It happens in that local club level as well. And these are regional or area forums where they can have a leadership learning experience a little closer to home. Right to it. You've three of these lined up for January. We do. Um, Our Northeast Leadership event will be in Clay Center on January the 20th. Our Southeast Leadership Forum will be in Emporia on January the 20th, and our Southwest Leadership Forum will be in Dodge City on January the 27th. And one of the exciting things about these opportunities is that they are for young people, usually 12 to 18, but there's also going to be a track for adult volunteers and parents as well. 
Let's lend details on those learning tracks then as you put them together. Now, noting that each of these three do differ in their structure, right? They do. They're each planned by Youth Leadership Council members in the areas. And so they are a little different because everybody has, you know, a different way of doing things and and things that they want to try. But one thing that will be the same across all of them is that there's a workshop for all of the youth on the book, Find Something to Do, No Prop Activities by Jim Kane. And through the generosity of the Kansas Electric Cooperative and CoBank, each one of our youth delegates will get a copy of that book to take home. And so that book is just full of ideas that they can then turn around and use in their clubs back home, in their project groups, in their schools, in their churches, um, wherever they're getting an opportunity to take a leadership role. So that session will be featured at each of the three, you're saying, correct? It will. And then we have a number of other workshops, and they're all going to be different at the different locations. But usually we have something on, you know, everything about Youth Council, uh, what's it all about. There's some that are focused on agriculture in the Northeast area, livestock judging, KAP success, leadership as behavior, also some community service things. In the Southeast area, we have the Poet Laureate of Kansas who will be giving a presentation. We also have a session on personal finances, camp games, and photography as well. And so just a variety of workshops at all of the different events. And you mentioned there will be companion opportunities for adults, parents, leaders, and otherwise. What will be the tone of those? We are working with both agents and uh, members of the Kansas Association of Volunteers on those. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them will have some information on how to make things hands-on learning in Kansas 4-H, improving club meetings, the marketing campaign, 4-H Growth Here, just, you know, all kinds of things that parents or volunteers can take back to their community to improve their 4-H program, their 4-H club, or their project group. So these are grand opportunities for young people as well as adults to sharpen their skills and their understanding of of leadership concepts. And even if a 4-H'er, Beth, has attended a K-State 4-H leadership forum of some kind before, they can pick up still more by participating in these as well, correct? Oh, most definitely. You know, there's there's something for everybody um, to learn. And one of the nice things about these is that they'll, they'll be a little smaller than something we might do on a state level. And so uh, more opportunities for interaction and, you know, more ways to learn. Excellent. Once again, there will be two of these taking place on Saturday, January the 20th, one at Clay Center, the other at Emporia, the following Saturday, the 27th of January in Dodge City. What about registration procedures here, Beth? The best way to register would be to go to the Kansas 4-H website, and that's www.kansas4h.org. And in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a button that says Register for Events. And if you click on that, you see all the events that are available to be registered for in Kansas 4-H, and these leadership events will be there. And any cost to attend? Yes. um, The cost for these workshops is between $20 and $25, depending on the location. That's to cover the materials and uh, meals and so forth, right? Exactly. And these, again, are listed on kansas4h.org. So learn more about these programs and follow up with registration in that they are taking place the mid to later part of January. Those registrations will be due shortly after the first of the year. So don't tarry on this. And Beth, just as a closing thought, this is more or less the uh, opening serve of what tends to be a pretty busy year leadership development-wise for Kansas 4-H. There'll be scores of other events taking place as we get into 2018. Yes, there sure will, and we'll be anxious to talk with you more about those. Um, This is certainly the first thing that our State Youth Leadership Council is involved in in the new year, but we have Citizenship in Action coming up, and of course, 48 Hours of 4-H, and again, we'll have the Kansas Leadership Forum next year.
And the cycle begins again. Thank you for sharing a moment on these upcoming area leadership learning opportunities around Kansas in January. And we will talk again soon. Appreciate it, Beth. Thank you so much, Eric. She's Beth Hinshaw, Research and Extension 4-H Specialist for K-State, based in southeast Kansas. Once more, January the 20th, Clay Center Emporia, January 27th in Dodge City, these youth leadership learning opportunities. That is this week's Kansas 4-H segment. As we part today, one more reminder that this broadcast is now available in podcast form. If you'd like to subscribe to that for listening on your mobile device or other apparatus, you can access that at our website, ksre.ksu.edu slash news. Click on the Radio Network tab, then the Agriculture Today link. Meantime, thanks for listening. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.